On this edition of Backroads, a quirky inspiration saves a painter's career. Boy, I think if I'd have thought about it, I probably never would have done it. Ready, set, go! A summer festival pits the small against the sweet. I love pie. We'll squeeze into an underground sanctuary and examine the remarkable career of dentist Virgil Stewart. He wasn't a legend in his own time, but he is now. This episode of Backroads will leave pretty smiles all around. <laughs> Backroads of Montana is made possible with production support from the Greater Montana Foundation, encouraging communication on issues, trends, and values of importance to Montanans. The Montana Office of Tourism at visitmt.com and the University of Montana. Home is where Montana is, Montana is my home. From mountain peaks to prairie lands, the places I have known. And I'm bound to ramble, yes I'm bound to roam. And when I'm in off the road now, boys, Montana is my home. Thanks for joining us on another episode of our show. Backroad searches for the independent spirit of Montana in people and places. Today, we're on the High Line between Chinook and Haver, traveling from museum to museum and stopping by an important archeological site. The Blaine County Museum in Chinook is part of the Bear Paw Battlefield National Historic Site. The Battlefield tour starts here with a dramatic audiovisual presentation that sets the stage for your visit to the battlefield located 15 miles south of Chinook on Highway 240. The final battle of the Nez Perce War of 1877 was fought here, and Chief Joseph gave his immortal speech, from where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. The museum's mural details the history of the long ago war. Our first story introduces us to an Eastern Montana man who's painted his share of murals, one of the many ways he gets people to see his art and to share it. But there's another aspect of his artistry that just might leave a bigger mark on your memory. Bob Watts is one prolific artist. Oils, acrylics, large, small animals, landscapes. It's mind-boggling, you know. He's built a theme park, wrote a book, performed on stage. He's a true Western artist. It even says so on his sign. But for some of Bob's paintings, there's something that doesn't sound quite right. That noise is a slap happy artist. It's not what he's painting, but how he's painting. It's like, how are you gonna paint any picture with that? And that's what everybody says is, how does he do that? No guy in his right mind probably would do that. Bob Watts isn't just a Western artist. Bob is the crowbar man. It's like, oh my God, how can anybody use a crowbar to paint? How he can do it with that crowbar is beyond me. <laughs> I wish I had a crowbar at City Hall more often sometimes, City Council meetings, but he, he puts a crowbar to a heck of a lot better use than most everybody else does, so. Um, well, another one of my voters. How many pictures do you think an artist would paint if nobody ever got to see him? It's the fundamental question that's driven Bob's career. He wants to create art, but he wants people to see the art. That's why he's about to paint a mountain cabin by a stream with acrylic paint on styrofoam with a crowbar. Actually, it's just like putting peanut butter on a piece of bread. You know how heavy that thing is after a while? Gee, that looks pretty good. I might quit right there. There are bigger parts to Bob's story than just a crowbar. He was born in Forsyth in 1938 and grew up on a farm in nearby Kinsey. He dreamed of making a living as an artist, but he put that on hold and instead worked a variety of jobs to support his family. There was some discouragement because at that time, getting into the art field would, would be just about impossible. A self-taught artist, Bob didn't give up, and after showing his artwork to a local women's club, he was asked to teach a class. Short story fast, why I had more students than I could handle. 
It launched a 30-year career as a traveling art instructor. He taught by demonstration in almost every small town in eastern Montana and western North Dakota, and eventually three other states. Bob estimates he taught 7,000 adult students. It was still a struggle to pay the bills, and his paintings weren't selling. He was desperate. So at a 1971 mall opening in North Dakota, he put down his paintbrush and picked up a crowbar. Well, I knew it would attract attention. My problem was, now, can I really do it, you know? And some people use that description of uh, a gimmick. And I guess perhaps it is and not something to be ashamed of because if it works, and boy, did it work. The crowbar paintings were easily Bob's biggest seller. And in recent years, he's also included the crowbar used to paint the picture. But the gimmick started to serve more purposes. Bob took the crowbar to art class to demonstrate technique. It opened our thinking outside the box of not just using the paintbrush. And if he could use a crowbar, we could use anything to paint with. Now I gotta put some shadow in order to show depth. Back at the painting, the cabin is taking shape. Bob is adding more detail as he shows an incredibly light touch filling in the foliage. Nobody expects it to be perfect if you're painting with a crowbar. Okay, I'm going back to the yellow. Coming along pretty good. I'm not done yet, though. In 2000, Bob moved back to his railroad town of Forsyth. The crowbar got him noticed and sold some paintings, but it was never just about that. He quickly realized retirement didn't suit him, so he picked up his paintbrush again and started to think big. It's 110 feet long and 32 feet high. There's nothing uh, that I can think of that compares in eastern Montana to this kind of uh, scale of artwork. Like his entire art career, the murals were about overcoming obstacles. Jeff Larnard made the first request in 2006 when he paid Bob to transform this wall It was pretty ugly to look at. into a train theme. The idea started to spread. Pharmacist Neil Donner looked outside his building and saw this. He asked Bob about a mural, but the pharmacy was entangled in a property dispute. Undaunted, Bob built his own ladder and scaffold and completed the painting without ever touching the ground. I really thought he couldn't do it. I should have known Bob would get it done. <laughs> a lot of obstacles, but uh, he, he got it done. The local newspaper building followed. As with all the others, it required grueling preparation with hand scraping and grinding to ensure a lasting mural on the century-old walls. He eventually tackled all four sides of the city's fire hall, complete with a local rancher's branding wall that doubled as a fundraiser for the project. It does nothing but beautify the community, uh, makes people proud of what they see around here. It is, it is such a neat deal. Nice colorful picture. That was a lot of fun. Bob finished his crowbar painting in about an hour. His art career is now a variation on that first question. How many pictures would an artist paint if lots of people got to see them? As he heads towards his 80s, Bob hopes to increase that number. We followed him as he finished this indoor mural for a Mile City family. It shows the four seasons, and there's already talk of more outdoor projects around the town of Forsyth. The outdoors are indoors here at the Blaine County Wildlife Museum in Chinook. Grizzlies and moose, foxes, antelope, waterfowl and birds fill these remarkably lifelike dioramas, giving you an up-close but safe encounter with some of Montana's most magnificent creatures. The exhibits are the work of Kurt Wonson and Elizabeth Marshall of Acorn Exhibits, who've designed and built installations for several museums across the West. Centuries ago, this bison plunging off a buffalo jump may have ended up in a fire pit as a nutritious meal for a native family that relied on the animal for sustenance. Our next story pits nutrition against fun. Each summer, folks travel to Polson to get their hands on a special treat from Flathead Lake. 
Northwest Montana's warm summer days and cool evenings help produce a sweet agricultural product. Cherries pop up everywhere in Polson today, on shirts, on bags, on rocks, on aprons. Not the prettiest one. In drinks, in jellies, in glass, in pies. I mean extra love, extra beautiful cherries, flathead cherries. Even a cherried out 64 cherry red Chevy makes an appearance on Main Street. Of course, you can have your cherries fresh off the trees, too. I have Lamberts and I have Bangs. Cherries fill the streets of Polson each July for the Flathead Cherry Festival. Because we are the home of the Flathead Cherry. <laughs> Polson business owner Jackie Kripe started the festival more than a decade ago. It's grown into one of Montana's biggest festivals. So we're really working and incorporating more flathead cherry products, more cherry quilts, jewelry, anything cherry. The weekend has become a big economic boon for local businesses. Because it brings a lot of people into the hotels, the restaurants, the gas stations, the RV resorts, you know, it just and the local businesses, it just does us all very well. And it's a family event, so we just want to make sure we have good quality products for our customers to come down and enjoy. Part of that family fun can be found in two unique events. First, contestants try to see who can spit a cherry seed the farthest. Spit it! And spit it this direction, please! Oh! Everyone's got their own approach. One leans back. Another takes a deep breath. Okay, that was just under 11. And sometimes there's even a false alarm. Oh, that's okay. But they all just let it fly. Oh. Oh. Down the block, it's time for the main event, the cherry pie eating contest. Ready, set, go! First, it's the kids' turn. They're off and eating. The rules are simple. Eat a piece of cherry pie without using utensils. No, no, no hands allowed. It's all mouth. <laughs> and probably nose. <laughs> faster, faster. Things start to slow down a bit. Eat it. And after a close call, a winner is declared. Six-year-old Keegan wins his first contest and knows what the best part is. Hi, cherries. Eat <laughs> the whole thing. I love pie. Ronan's Brittany Bowles warms up for her turn in the next heat. Last year, I was in the kids' division and I ate a piece of pie as fast as I could and I beat everybody. I was very proud of it. But her competition looks hungry this year. It'll be tough to repeat. Okay, go ahead. The chomping begins as Brittany puts her game plan into action. My strategy is to eat the crust first because that's the hardest part. It it's like kills you at the end if you don't eat it first. And then I go through the best part and it just helps you finish it easier. I work my pie backwards. In the end, she just misses out. But she still finishes her plate down to the last lick of her favorite flathead cherries. As some wipe the cherry stains from their mouths, folks try to gobble up as much as they can before this very cherry weekend on Flathead Lake comes to an end. Watch for us again next year. <laughs>
and a special place for all local residents. We were fortunate to tag along on a summer hike when one family went to a special place they've enjoyed for generations. We're on a hike in the Sweetgrass Hills in Liberty County. Great place. It's For us, it's really close. And we can come up here in an afternoon and get away from the uh, heat because it's usually cooler up here. And, and it's good recreation, good hike. Rudy Seeson and his wife are taking friends up and away from the prairie. Their destination offers an interesting surprise. The Sweetgrass Hills were formed when igneous rock was pushed up out of the prairie. Their slight elevation means cooler temperatures and more precipitation. After a brisk mile and a half hike, the group arrived at the special spot which has as many names and stories as the hills themselves. It's called the Devil's Chimney Cave. Most people refer to it as the Devil's Chimney Cave. And uh, it is a limestone outcropping and the you can crawl in it and it has kind of a big cavern in there, so it's kind of fun to go to. I was a little surprised about having a cave surrounded by trees. Ronan Devlin is the youngest member of the group. He's from Massachusetts, visiting relatives in Montana. It is very different. There's not as many houses or streets around here. When Ronan saw the first opening to the cave, it was actually at the top. Entering here would mean about a 20-foot drop to the cave floor. From the meadow below, they saw a second opening that's also from the cave ceiling. The group hiked down to the other side to enter on the cave floor, except there's a catch. You had to wiggle your way into the cave. <laughs> but the belly crawl of about 15 feet is worth it. Once inside, it's apparent why tribes referred to this as the spiritual center of the Sweetgrass Hills. The openings above work as skylights to reveal the limestone cave formations, and even more places to explore. Ah, Ronan disappeared. There's like a chunk of rock just sitting there. Oh yeah, right there? Yeah. yeah. I'm thinking about to fall any second. It was really weird seeing, being surrounded by a dome of rock and then seeing just like a, a cloud just floating around. After squeezing back out, the group was back on the trail, completing a day hike adventure on Montana's high plains. It's so different than the surrounding prairie. And uh, so it's kind of our own special little place here. A reminder that access is limited at the Devil's Chimney site. You have to cross private land, so you should visit the local conservation district for a map and to get the appropriate permissions. There are few restrictions for visitors here at the Wapachugan Archaeological Site. There aren't any glass cases or security guards warning you not to touch the artifacts. That reflects the spirit of John Brumley, the local man who went exploring as a teenager in 1961 and stumbled upon Indian artifacts. The Milk River Archaeological Society conducted some initial excavations and discovered the significance of the site. Today, John Brumley and his wife Anna manage the Buffalo Jump and Interpretive Center, where visitors learn about the skills of early hunters, like throwing a spear with an atlatl. Throughout history, Montanans have always been proud of our tradition of rugged individualism, and we cherish our natural rights of liberty and freedom. A question of rights takes us to central Montana and the story of Virgil Stewart, who spent a lifetime balancing the conflict between his legal rights and his compassionate nature. Virgil Stewart didn't know it yet, but his 50-year career in dentistry would start today. It was winter, 1912, and Virgil was rooming with Bill Kleiman, a blacksmith with a very sore tooth. Kleiman wanted it out immediately and picked Virgil Stewart for the job. Virgil was reluctant, he had no tools, so Kleiman sawed the tines from a pitchfork, heated and hammered them into shape, fashioning a strong set of forceps. Kleiman sat down and let Virgil go to work. Within minutes, Kleiman's sore molar was sitting on his anvil. That tooth was followed by nine more, all infected. 
What made this procedure so remarkable was the fact that Virgil Stewart had no medical training and no license. He had no right to be a dentist. Virgil was, by training, a school teacher, by occupation, a homesteader, and by temperament, an extraordinarily compassionate individual who hated to see anyone in pain. He virtually never said no to people in need. Uh, he, he, he would tell them that he, they should probably do, see somebody else if they could possibly do so, but uh, he never turned them away. When he wasn't teaching school, Virgil was delivering mail, a long route that took him past the ranch of Violet Weaver, also a homesteader and a registered nurse. Twice each week they met at Violet's mailbox, fell in love, and in 1915 married. Both continued to work their claims until they proved up. Then they loaded Virgil's mail wagon and moved east to Garfield County to start a family. One of Virgil's new neighbors was Dr. Frank Amdor, who, although retired, still dispensed medical advice and aid during local emergencies. But Dr. Amdor drew the line at pulling teeth, so he gave Virgil a proper set of forceps and an anesthesia kit. After all, as a trained nurse, Violet could administer that. Their tight-knit rural community was 100 miles from any real dentist, and no one could possibly afford such work. So the task fell to Virgil. His daughter Alice remembers his reluctance to pull teeth. To him, a lost tooth was a bit of life lost. He saw girls made old while still in their teens, and children become dental cripples, all because there was no one to fill cavities in time to save them. When Virgil's young son, Calvin, developed a cavity, Virgil ordered a set of hand picks and filling material. He cleaned, filled, and for the first time, saved a tooth. Heartened, Virgil began to collect more dental equipment and acquire the skills to use it. He bought a dental library and a foot-powered drill. He learned how to make dentures and remove cysts. This went on for 15 years until their hardscrabble farm failed. The Stewarts, now totaling nine, moved back to central Montana. Here on more productive land, Virgil could concentrate on farming and quit dentistry. Besides, Lewistown, with real dentists, was a short drive away. The Judith Basin was lush, but folks hard hit by the Depression were just as poor, so Virgil continued his avocation. He justified his practice by never calling himself a dentist and never charging money. Chickens, vegetables, and used clothing were likely pay for services rendered. He had gotten himself into a corner from which there was no escape. Mother aided and abetted this husband, who was headed for trouble, as surely as tooth decay. Alice Stewart Miller. Trouble arrived on a spring night in 1934, when a man showed up with his young daughter. The father claimed she had two aching teeth and he wanted them out. Virgil obliged, then refused pay when it was offered. The man tossed a half dollar on the table, grabbed his daughter, and quickly left. It turned out later that this man had been sent out by the Dental Association because he was supposed to uh, try to trap him into, into, to, into asking for money and then taking it. And uh, the, uh, they managed to get him arrested. Apparently, the Montana State Dental Association was not amused with Virgil's activities. They were certain he had no right to practice dentistry. Virgil quickly learned just how many friends he had. They paid his bail and found a lawyer, future U.S. Congressman James O'Connor, who took on Virgil's case for free. The prosecution's case was simple. Virgil was practicing without a license. But O'Connor put the prosecution on trial, questioning their attack. Upon this caring individual, the embodiment of the Good Samaritan. When Mr. O'Connor finished, there was hardly a man in the jury box whose eyes were dry. And Father himself said that Mr. O'Connor had made him feel like Christ before Pilate. Alice Stewart Miller. It took the jury only one hour, and when their verdict of not guilty was read, the Fergus County Courthouse, packed with friends and sympathizers, erupted. Meanwhile, just down the road in Hobson, folks wanted a town dentist. In particular, they wanted Virgil. So that's where he and Violet set up shop. Virgil put his calling card in the cement entryway to their new office. 
his initials, in teeth. For the next 30 years, those initials greeted thousands of patients. Virgil was charging fees now, not much, but enough to fulfill his and Violet's dream of sending their kids to college. In 1951, the State Dental Association came after him again. This time, three Helena legislators took up the cause with a bill specifically written on Virgil's behalf. But it wasn't needed. The Dental Association agreed to drop its case if Virgil limited his practice to Hobson. So here he stayed, straightening and saving teeth until his death in 1967. It's spaghetti day at the Hobson Senior Center. For many, lunch is going down thanks to Virgil's work. Real dentist Bill Thomas retired to Hobson and on occasion sees some of Virgil's lasting craftsmanship. I just have so much admiration for the man. I saw a few of his patients, and the, the patients that I saw just uh, without fail impressed me with the quality of their work. Almost everyone here owes something to Violet and to Virgil Stewart, self-made dentist of the Judith Basin. In fact, that's the title of daughter Alice Stewart Miller's loving tribute to her parents. A book you might expect would be dedicated to them. Instead, its dedication is to the good people of Montana, who gave Virgil Stewart the right to practice dentistry. And that's our show. We'd like to thank the friendly folks at the Blaine County Museum, the Blaine County Wildlife Museum, the Bear Paw Battlefield National Historic Site, and here at the Wapachugan Archaeological Site in Haver for all their help. The museums and sites are open year-round, but be sure to check their hours online. You can visit us online at montanapbs.org or on Facebook, where you can leave a story idea. It really does work. Two stories on today's show, The Hobson Dentist and The Forsyth Artist, were suggested by viewers. Or you can mail your idea to Backroads of Montana, the University of Montana, Missoula, Montana 59812. As long as you keep watching, we'll keep covering the back roads of Montana. I'm William Marcus. See you next time. Backroads of Montana is made possible with production support from the Greater Montana Foundation, encouraging communication on issues, trends, and values of importance to Montanans. The Montana Office of Tourism at visitmt.com and the University of Montana. Montana is my home From mountain peaks to prairie lands The places I have known And I'm bound to ramble Yes, I'm bound to roam And when I'm in off the road now, boys Montana is my home Coming in off the road now, boys You know I'm heading home